Hello Internet. We're going to start looking at how to build your own single purpose blockchain in the series. I had written about my thoughts uh, on Substrate in a Medium post, which I will link to in the description. I was looking for a simple yet realistic example to demonstrate the use of Substrate. So that's when this whole Wall Street bets and this GME fiasco happened. So I thought it would be pretty cool to build a stock exchange emulator on Substrate. So we're going to start by downloading the latest version of the node template and we're going to prepare an environment for that. So if you go to github.com substrate developer hub substrate node template, pretty much it has a sample node, which is the blockchain backend, which, which has the basic bit of functionality, I think just balances and the system palette and all that configured. So this is most of what you would want and you can just focus on writing your state transition logic here. So the code base also has a Rust setup that you would want to do, but I'm going to skip this because I already have a Rust on the latest nightly on my machine, but you could follow this documentation and there's also the scripts uh, in it as such that you can run to uh, late, get the latest nightly and also get the VASM target on this. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and clone this repository. And I'm going to clone this to stock exchange here. So this is targeting version 201 as of the recording. So since I already have the Rust environment set up, I'm just going to run a cargo build on this. This, if you're running it for the first time, it would take any, I have a fairly top of the line MacBook Pro and it takes about 15 minutes on this. So it is a bit taxing. So just wait for it. I'll meet you once the build is finished. So this will probably be a good time to catch a coffee or eat your lunch. So yeah, it's done compiling now. So it, as you see, it took about 12 minutes on my machine. So yeah. So let me open up VS Code and I'll walk you through some of the code in this. So I'm just going to Close this, yeah. All right. So if you see here, if you open up cargo.com, so this is a cargo workspace kind of project. It has three members in it. So it has the node, the runtime, and the pallets. Now, node, node is where basically all the, the core binary is, right? When you say, when you compile it and then you get the node template binary, so this is the project that actually executes the binary. Now, palettes is basically where all your bits and bobs of your blockchain logic is. It defines custom storage items, possible transactions, which are called extrinsics in substrate land, events that can be generated when these calls are made, and there are errors that can happen if the calls fail. Now, we will spend most of our time working in this layer, right? and most of substrate's functionality, like balances, accounts, the core system stuff, sudo and all that are implemented as palettes and are accessible simply by importing those libraries. This is also where we'll deal with substrate specific syntax, like the decal storage macros and things like that. And then there's the runtime. A runtime is basically where we bring all these palettes together and construct a runtime. This is the part that gets compiled down to WebAssembly and can be upgraded on the fly. The substrate node executable loads this runtime in a VASM environment and runs logic for every transaction and also for block finalization. So this is the smallest unit of blockchain that's serviceable once it's deployed to production. We'll do some work here, especially when we are dealing with things like off-chain workers and such. Uh, and also when we have to wire up pallets so that, it, for example, when we write a stock exchange pallet, we want it to depend on balances so that we can transfer balances and so on and so forth. So we'll, we'll be dealing with that in the runtime layer. 
And so let's uh, just launch the node and see what happens. And then we'll also walk through the code and see where, what that goes through. I'm going to do that. So before launching this, uh, so go to target release. So if you do an LS here, and this is where, so this is where node template is. And this, this is possibly what we'll be looking at. And there's also this W build directly, which has a node template runtime. And that's what is the wasm that the runtime was compiled down to. So we'll also see if you can do a runtime upgrade as part of this. So, so I'm going to do a target release node template. I'm just going to purge the chain because I've been playing around with this and I, I want to delete the database. So when you do a purge chain, it basically deletes our existing database. So you start from a fresh state. So and then I'm going to do, I'm going to start the state. So notice that I'm starting it with a hyphen hyphen dev flag, which actually starts our chain in the development mode. And you have predefined set of accounts that are started and they're pre-funded and so on and so forth. So it's useful for testing and so on and so forth. Now, if you see here, uh, so there's a version of Substrate that you start with. There's a whole bunch of emojis. I love emojis on the console. Of course, I, I think there's a flag to disable that as well. It says that it's actually using authority and use a consensus algorithm called Aura, which is basically a proof of authority based chain. And it's already started importing these blocks. So let's try connecting to the chain and see what's happening. So I'm gonna open up Chrome again. But this time I'm going to go to an incognito mode and I'm going to access the. So if you go to polkadot.js.org, uh, so this is basically where polkadot specific wallets and stuff like that are. So this is the app's wallet for polkadot. So you can use this to connect to any substrate based chain, even though it says polkadot. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to use this and we're going to connect to our. So by default, it connects to Polkadot node. We're going to connect to our development node, which is on 9944. So this port number, so in case you want to look at where this port number is, it says listening for new connections here on port 9944. So this is the port that we're going to start with. So again, switch on to this. And you can see it's already started importing these blocks. And if you look at any of these blocks, there is just one extrinsic with a non origin called set the timestamp. So it basically sets the current timestamp and that's for it. So there's nothing interesting happening at this point in time. So let's have a look at accounts. Now, as I said, there are some pre funded accounts. You can like create an account here. So I'm just going to do this. Since it's an incognito mode, I don't care. I'm just going to throw away this account. I'm going to call this party. I have a very unique password on this because who cares? And save this. And you could do transfers. So you can either send it here or I wanted to show you how extrinsics work. And I say, from Alice, who has a lot of money, I'm going to send it to myself. That's me, Ravi, this account. And I'm going to send, say, 500 units. Now, let's go, we'll customize all this. we we'll change the unit and things like that on our chain. But I just want to show how to do So you do this, and it says that sending this transaction balances dot transfer test comma value. This is what is happening. And there's a series of 125 micro units that will be applied to this transaction, which is pretty neat for sending 500. You just, you just spend 125 micro units, that's not bad. So let's go ahead and do that. And it happens and it's already in block. And if you look at the Explorer again, so it says that there's been a recent event on block 31 and it's already on block 33 and that's been finalized. And when you say this is finalized, this is the grandpa block. So there are two consensus algorithms that run on a substrate. One is Aura, uh, one is Aura which kind of implodes the blockchain and then like, it validates it and produces a block. So that's one of the consensus algorithms. The second consensus algorithm basically is pretty much similar to how Ethereum 
lock uh, sorry, the, the Bitcoin one where you have the longest chain wins sort of rule. So that's that. This is the finalized block which says that. So as long as you're building off the finalized block, then you're good. So that means that more than 66% of the network has agreed that this is the best block to build up. So this is there on the 31st block and there, are, there is a transaction on this and you can see there was a new account that was created and then uh, that's because our account was zero. So there was a new account that was created and then there's a balances was somehow endowed and then there was a transfer that was done actually. So this is, these are basically the events that happen as a part of that. So you would actually write our events and so on and so forth. Now, the uh, code that we have also has template module and those have two transactions as well. So there's do something and there's cause it. So before that, let's look at some the chain state. Chain state is basically where this is where you can query the database of things like that. So we're going to go to the template module and we're going to look at the something accessor that's defined on that. Now this is an option of U32. I mean, option of U32 basically means that it can either be some or some value or it's none. So, so let's, so that's nothing. So there's none. So let's go ahead and follow this extrinsic template module. And then we say do something and we put in some value. So let's say 42 because it's the answer to the ultimate question of life. In so let's submit this transaction and we are going to sign this as Alice and go ahead and submit this. So this is ready. Now it's going to get into the block once it's done. So the target block production time is six seconds. So if you actually go back to the explorer for a second, you see the target is six seconds and this is the time since the last block. So since you're running locally, most of it should be fine. Let's go back to the change state and go back to the template module and ready for this again. And you can see it's 42. Yay, we've done our first read and write to the database using blockchain. So let's understand the code behind this and see if we can change it in certain ways and see how that goes. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to our VS code. And as I said, the bits and bobs of your transactions are in your palettes. And in this case, this is called the template palette. And this is libdrs. So every structure of libdrs would have approximately this. So you would have a pub trait. So this basically says what your, what's your contract for your palette. And the right here is, it's just the event. So it has nothing, I mean, it inherits from the system trait. That means that it has account ID, things like that. And then it, it also has this associated type called event. And I think it's just from the SPSTD value module, but I may be wrong, I'll look into it. But it basically says that it, it expects an event object, which can be converted from an event of self and it's, it should also be convertible to a frame system traits event, right? So these are some type constraints on this type, on this trait. And then you have these four macros that are there. So there's this decal storage, decal event, decal error, and decal multi. So let's go over them one after the other. So the first one is decal storage. And this, I have a love-hate relationship with the module, right? So I love it because it's functional, it generates a ton of code for us, but I hate it because it's really confusing, right? And this is not trustful. So anything that you see within decal storage, even though you have these uh, highlighted keywords and all those kind of things, this is not trustful. This is very specific code that the decal storage macro understands. It's a prop macro, so it basically takes it in as a token stream, and then it spits out some of the token stream, right? So so let's start with it. Then it basically has a trait called store, and it says it is for this particular module, which is declared below, which also has this name T. But you just have to think of it as incantations here at this point in time. And then it says as template module. Now, when in the UI, when you saw that it was uh, it has a selected state within this module, so you see it in the chain chain state as well as in extrinsics. So you have this uh, template module. So that is the name it comes from. So if you rename this here, that module will change. So, and then it says something get function something. So something is the name of the storage that you're going to store. And we are saying that this is accessible by a getter and we're going to call the method that calls it something. 
and this is going to be exposed via the RPC, right? So you can actually call an RPC or something and get the value. And then this is basically an option of U32. U32 is unsigned in 32 and option because it could also be not. Okay, so that's that's echo storage. It takes a little getting used to, but over the course of our videos and get more into it, we'll talk about maps, double maps, we'll talk about hashing functions and all the good stuff in here. And trust me, I mean, even though it looks a little ugly, it generates a ton of code for you, which is good. And in frame V2, this thing is changing with the palette trait coming along, and there's the palette macro, which would hopefully simplify this and make it more Rust-like. Okay, so that's it. So let's talk about the next thing I want to talk about is the decal module. We'll get to the event and error soon, but this is what I want to do. Now, decal module, again, we have this pub struct, this thing, and then there's this forward call. Again, this is not like Rust syntax. So there's probably a struct, and then, then there's an impl for it, and then there's an impl for call module. And this call basically is generated by the deck model itself, depending on the calls here. So don't worry too much about this. Again, you have to treat it as an inc incantation here and then just go with that, right? Because you have this where calls and you have this for calls and you have the struct calls and it's, it looks like, hey, what is this? Is it a struct definition or a trait definition? Or is it like an input definition? What the hell is this? And this is it, right? I mean, you gotta deal with it. So there is one associated type here, again, it says it's an error, and error is of error of key. That, that's there. So it's again one incantation that you should know. And there is a deposit event, which is default. Again. Yeah, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, whatever I'm here. So this is it. So trust me, beyond this, it will get a little easier to understand. We'll also understand this in detail as we go forward. But right now, you know, because it's incantations, even though they look like trash code, they're not, it's okay to be perfectly confused by them. <laughs> you know, I was at least. And then, okay, now comes the need of the implementation. So we said we had two extrinsics, and they are basically two different methods. So it has two arguments. The first one is an origin, again, no type, because it is a type origin. And then there is uh, something which is U32, right? which, which is what we're going to take. And this returns a dispatch result. So the dispatch result basically is an OK of a unit, or it is an error of this type, uh, whatever we declare an error. We'll get to that. Sure. So, so the first method that we want to know is we want to make sure that who makes this call has is a validated account and has some balance that we can that we can use. We, we saw that it, it takes certain uh, uh, gas transaction fees for it. And here in this case, there is a base transaction fee of 10,000 plus whatever is required for a single write, right? This is the weight and this is the transaction fees that we would have to pay. And a nice thing about the substrate is that your transactions are basically the same unit as your base currency. So it's not like ETH and gas so whatever is your unit, that's your that's what you need to have to pay for gas as well, right? So there, there is no separate gas concept. Uh, maybe it would when it comes to in contract, but we'll talk about that later. So here we have a who, and we say basically we have an ensure signed on this. So they want to make sure that they have a valid private key and that they have a valid account with an existential balance for us for them to be able to call this transaction. And what they're going to do is basically replace the something's value with whatever value that they get. So whatever value you get here, that's what we're going to store. And once we store it, we're going to deposit an event and call something stored. Now, if you recall our explorer, let's see if the transaction still is there. So you say, so it says template module dot something stored. This is the event that, you know, that's there. So even documentation should end with an array that provides descriptive names or even parameters, right? And it shows that you have to do something. But these are the parameters that get stored, like 42 and has. So if you see here, we are saying something stored, something and who, and that's what is the event. And where is the something stored even coming from? That's coming from the decal event macro. And decal event macro basically has this, right? It says, 
in this is the email documentation. And so this is the documentation that basically comes up on the UI as well. So which is pretty cool because it says transfer succeeded here. So this is like the doc comment that's on top of the event that for balances to transfer. So this is the doc comment on something stored. So if we change that and check we will so we say that something has been stored on the blockchain by and something here. So that's that's good, right? So let's that's it. And so and that, that's what like shows up here. And let's also look at the cause error method. And the cause error method basically does this value and it tries to do a check add. So check add is because you don't want this value to overflow, right? So when you when you when you have this put something so when, you, when you're putting something like that, this is a U32. So when when something overflows here, you want to make sure that you know you you raise an error. And here we call it overflow error. And this is again a part of the tackle error macro. So where there is an enum for again for module three T, which is which is basically enum value and storage overflow. So and so we can we can basically raise this event. So remember that this actually is a result object. So an OK OKR OK is basically the same as because this is going to give you an option. A check that is going to give you an option. And so we turn the option into a result by saying that if it is a sum value, then you basically return. If it's a sum value, then you extract the value and store it in new. Otherwise, or rather give an OK, turn it to a result. And if it is not an error and it's something, then if it's a non value, then you turn it into an error and you want to return that. So that's about it. And if it's good, then we just put something new here and then return an OK on this. And this is a match statement. Rust is an awesome language. I uh, I actually initially learned Rust and then I picked up Substrate, but Rust is an awesome language. So I also want to talk very quickly about the tests here. So in the tests, so we have the mock here, which I wanted to talk about for a really quick second here. The mock method basically emulates a new module for you. So if you see here, the module that that is gotten from is basically got from this crate, which is the palette crate that we have. And it actually creates a module of test. And the test is basically an empty struct. It has a few parameter types that basically gets created. This is a macro again from frame support that actually uh, creates a bunch of access methods and even type classes for these things. But let's ignore that for now. We actually impel in the system trait for test. If you notice here, we actually said that we have a trait which implements system trait. So we are satisfying that in our mock by doing this. And then we also impel the uh, uh, trait for test, which is what it is. And we say this is an event type, which is basically a, a unit that we have here. And we actually instantiate a module and we actually create a new chain for every test that we have. So we have this helper function called new test x, which actually gives test external externality struct. Well, try saying it fast. It's hard. So what it does is it this allows you to run a test from this. So let's see how this is being used. So in your test, this is just standard Rust test framework, cargo test sort of thing. So here, the test externalities object has an execute with method on it, which actually takes a block. If you see here, it has an fn once out here, which then returns whatever is the generic that it wraps over. So here, all it does is that we do a couple of assertions by making sure that when we call this, it's an asset okay. That means it's a dispatch result of okay. And then we can also assert equality on the getter method. So we said that we have a getter method for something which is declared on the module. So we can call that and assert that this has a sum of 42. And then you can run this test. So it's going to do this quick cargo thing. 249 crates. If you do the node template, it's 900 odd crates. This is 250 odd crates. And you might think that it's a little excessive. I certainly think so. But yeah, it is what it is. So 
it's going to run this test and say that it's successful. So we can also see it fail. So this is cool because uh, you can actually do TDD with your substrate code. So which is pretty cool. So this is what we're going to do. So we are trying, we'll mix a small change in the code, nothing major. So what we'll do is instead of when you call do something and whatever value it comes, we actually let's multiply it by hundred and then store it. And we will try to fix the text test for it. And let's build this and then let's try to do, and the chain is still running. So let's try to do a hot runtime upgrade on this and we'll close the video. So this, this is still running. Let's see. Because I don't want to change the code and cause the test to fail. So we're just going to wait for a second. A little more than a second, I suppose. All right, the test passed. So I'm going to go ahead and change the code here. Baby steps, you know, let's try to do a small change and then we'll try to do something bigger. After. So, okay, instead so of put something, what we're going to do is we're going to start a small change. So let's go to test. Hopefully this time it will be much faster to execute it and this should fail. So it's just running cargo check first because we changed that once cargo check finishes this will run. Yeah, I'm going to kill this task and then do it on the console, right? So let's see. CD palettes template. I'm going to do a combo test on this. That's interesting. What is waiting on the Let me see if I can fill this task. I have to understand my panic handlers. Let me go ahead and It's going to restart the server. Sometimes this happens. So let's just reload the raster analyzer and then start here. Right, this is all good. I'm just going to kill all cargo. It's going to trigger off another cargo check. Yeah, I think it's making some 
progress now. So this is actually a little annoying. I mean, it doesn't happen too often, but sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's not the most ideal way to build things. I'm going to exit VS Code, fill all the cargo, and going to do a cargo test. I just want to show that it fails. So, and I want to show you know what a failure looks like. I mean, if you're already done Rust development, it wouldn't be that bad. But uh, if you haven't done then I just wanted to see how that looks. So you have this left sum of 4200 and right sum of 42. So obviously because our expectation was wrong. So let's go ahead and fix that. Code down. Let's start VS code again. Fix it and run this. Yes. So go to test. So we Said that our asset okay should work here. I'm going to get rid of this dev container stuff. No VS code, I don't want that. And I'm going to run the cargo just again. Ah, that. Hopefully, things. Yeah, I'm going to just let this cargo check to finish. And if I have to, I'll probably edit it out on the video. All right, so cargo check is complete. So I'm going to run the test again and show that this passed. Oops, no. Okay. I'm pretty sure there isn't any build running. Just indexing stuff. So that shouldn't, that should not block the build directly. So let me see. Huh. Ah, okay. This is blocking my build directly. So this is gone. Okay. My bad. So I'm going to run this test here. You probably have done that. Yeah. All right, this works. So we're all good. This is good. I mean, I think I ran the cargo test from the stock exchange directory, so which is not a good idea. So you wanted to run it from the pallet directory, which would be, you know, much better. So it was my mistake after all. So we got the test working. That's good. Let's do a quick test of it in the UI. So let's go here. Yeah, before that, we need to deploy this thing, right? So to do that, we need to build our runtime, like I said. Uh, so if you go back to VS Code for a second and look at runtime, this is the project. We haven't talked a lot about it. I just said that it's used to configure your runtime. If you see here, we have our PubUse palette template, which is the crate that we are importing. And we also configure a whole bunch of traits, right? I mean, so this is the frame system trait. As you recall, our palette template trait inherits frame system trait. So we configure this and we configure a whole bunch of other traits from other palettes. And of course, we also configure our own trait, which is our palette template right? and trait and which the only thing that it needs is the event call. Right? And so that's it. So after we configure these palettes, we actually construct our runtime. And again, this is one of those macros that generates a whole bunch of code. If you recall, we actually created a template module struct ourselves by calling the frame support module and so on and so forth. But here, all that code is going to get generated by this macro. And 
yeah that's that and then this whole punch of oil paper that we will look into at a later point in time okay that's that let's go ahead and build this the cargo system has this build where you can override your build method and do some interesting things here we are using the Vasm Builder, which is a part of the Substrate Vasm Builder. This actually creates your Vasm, its metadata for that, and so on and so forth. So this is going to do all that stuff for us. What we're going to do is we're going to go to runtime, and then we're going to do a cargo build release. So this is going to build our Vasm. And what we're going to do is, while the chain is running, right, while this block is, without restarting the chain, we're going to upgrade our logic on the blockchain, and we're going to see how that works. And I, I mean, this is one of the coolest bits of Substrate, is that you can have the runtime as if it's, it's another transaction on that. So we're going to wait for this build to finish. Like I said, there's a whole lot of waiting for a substrate that you build. So I get reminded of this XKCD comic, which basically says, you know, what's, what's your reason for slacking off and it's compiling. And so I think that's part of the course when you're dealing with a language like Rust, which is, which is extremely smart. The Rust compiler is really smart. And coupled with Clippy, which is just like the old Microsoft assistant that comes up, if you're, if you're old enough to remember. So Clippy is actually, can pretty much write your code for you. So once I actually had some Go code that I wanted to rewrite into Rust, and I basically copy pasted that code, and just kept following Clippy comments <laughs> on your code. And then I swear, it writes code by itself. It's amazing. So, why is six order five time you close? So this is probably the most boring video on YouTube. It's like watching paint dry, I suppose. Watching builds, you know, and progress bars is, is boring. <laughs> but yeah, let's see. Okay, we've got this. So we have the Wasm file. Now, where is the Wasm file? So since it's a workspace project, everything would be in your target release. We have the node template, sorry, this would have the W build, which is the Wasm build environment, and then node template runtime. So if you look at this, it's 1604, and so yeah, we just got done with this one. So let's go ahead and deploy this, right? So we again go to extrinsics, and then so here the owner of the key is important. So let me quickly talk about the pseudo module. So we're gonna we're gonna use the pseudo module to uh, do some do this deployment. And the reason this works is that in in the node module, so there is this thing called chain spec. And in chain spec, we say this is the pseudo ID, right? And so Alice is going to be our root key or a pseudo key. So only Alice can call pseudo. And the system set code function that we're going to use for deploying the binary needs to be from the pseudo account, right? So we need to be able to do this. We're going to talk a lot more about these kind of things, but just know that this exists now. So we go here and we go to pseudo palette and we say we're going to pseudo unchecked wait call. So this, the reason why we're going to do unchecked wait is because binary is is larger than most transactions. If depending on the you know bytes that you're sending in, you're gonna charge get charged so many units and, and there's no way in 
anyone would have enough balances to actually uh, do a runtime upgrade. So this is going to be an unchecked wait call, and this would basically be a set code function on this. And this is going to be our code. We're going to upload a file. So we're going to come here and go to so we did this and zero. So I'm just going to do a CD into this directory, or I'm just going to open this directory. And let me bring this over. So there's our wasm file that we have at photocopium that we built. So I'm just going to deploy this. I'm going to drag this file and drop it on to this. Cool. So it's about 250k. So I'm just going to do this. Yes, this is Alice. And let's do this. And the chain is going to get upgraded. So I'm just wondering if it tries anything in the log. Okay, you should have started the L runtime debug to see if there are some debug logs on this. But yeah, I mean, it's as long as it's in chain, so you can go back to the explorer to find out. And the SODO just took place, right? And this is the result. So there uh, was an error. Interesting. Let's see if this worked though. Um, extrinsics. We're gonna do sorry, template module do something 500. Now, this should get multiplied by 100, so this should be you know, 5000 when it reaches the chain. Let's see if it works. I doubt that because it's a, a tiny error, but I don't know what. So, let's go to chain state. So, frantic module, this is what we wanted. Still says 50. So, clearly, the update didn't take place. We definitely did something wrong. So, let me see what's wrong with that. All right. So, let's see. If, uh, let me start. Okay. We did that. We built it. Um, I'm sure it's the root account. Um, oh, uh, I think we do have to change the runtime uh, version of it. So I think when we scroll through this, we saw the runtime version. So we need to change the spec version. So the spec version of this is uh, 200 that we have. And I think if this version is not upgraded, it's not going to run this. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to do another build of the runtime. Runtime can't go build, please. So this just compares the runtime now. This is much better than the last time. Hopefully it's, it's done. Yeah, this is done. So we're going to do the same spiel again. So we're going to go to extrinsics. We're going to go to sudo. I'm going to say sudo with unchecked weight. We're going to call system set code. And we're going to go to our finder. Get our wasm in here. Try to drop this. Oops, I dropped it in the wrong bag and drop it right here. Oh, I should say it's a file of my bag. Does this JavaScript thing magic? And then it gets it here and let's see, submit. It's in block, let's go to the explorer to make sure it is here. And the result is okay, yes, we we upgraded our chain. Let me see if there's something in the logs. Yeah, I don't think that I can see. It says that it's been there, but so let's let's try doing an extrinsic call again. Let's go here, let's go to template module, do something 42, it should be 4200. Let's see. All right, it's in block. 
So let's go back to chain stage. Then we want you, we have this, let's play. Yes, and it's 4200. Yes, we just successfully upgraded our chain as well. So thanks. This is what I had in my first video. So we saw how you set a chain up and, you know, we actually saw the structure of a blockchain. We basically looked at the node, runtime, and the palette things here. We actually looked at how the tests are written and we actually did a forkless upgrade of this and we ran into an issue and we fixed it as well. So that's all cool. So thank you if you liked it, you know, comment, like, subscribe, all the YouTube specific stuff that you do. So you know what to do. All right. Bye-bye.